Thank you, Steve, and thank you for joining this panel uh, today. I mean, we've heard earlier this morning from uh, the marketers involved in their um, view of data and application of data. And so this panel, we're going to hear from a number of folks in the agency and the data fields. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here, too, because I never thought that as a media guy, I would be sitting on a and chairing a data panel, and it, it's a really good indication of just where the business is going and how it's changing, and there's clearly a lot of interest in this uh, in this group, but also of the wider marketing community and and the business about where data is taking us and how it's changing the way our, our business is working and how we can become more responsive as marketers in delivering, um, delivering a greater customer experience. So uh, let me kind of introduce the panel that we have uh, with us today. Uh, to my immediate left is Shana Boone, who is VP of Marketing Science for Critical Mass. Critical Mass is a Canadian-based company, a digital, global digital agency in the Omnicom family, and they create digital experiences for clients such as Nissan and Infinity and City and HP. Shana uh, had built up the marketing science group in, um, in um, Critical Mass. Next to Shana is Greg Kos Korsko, uh, who is VP of Media Solutions at Dunhumby. Dunhumby, for those of you who don't know, is a customer insights company best known for uh, managing the customer databases for major retailers such as Tesco, Kroger, and Macy's. And they work with marketers and developing DM loyalty and branding programs and really closing the loop and translating them to retail sales. Next is Pete Stein, who's president of Razorfish. Uh, Razorfish describes themselves as sitting in the intersection of media, technology, and creative. A uh, number of the clients that Pete works for is Mercedes-Benz, uh, Starwood Hotels Group, and Microsoft and essentially works with them to develop customer digital marketing solutions. And Pete leads the Eastern region, based here in New York. Next to him, right along, is Randy Watson, VP of Client Services for Financial for Axiom. Axiom offers various marketing and information management services, including multi-channel marketing, addressable advertising, and data management services. And Randy sort of sees his role as informing decisions and enabling database decisions. And uh, right at the end is Sandra Zarati. Sandra is an author, speaker, and marketer. She is VP of uh, Marketing Executive Briefings and Education, which is a, a formerly an IBM and RICO company based out of uh, Boulder in Colorado. So we've got a great panel here, and I'm really looking forward to to sort of hearing from them. Um, let me kind of just kick off a little bit on, on the data um, area and try and set some sort of context. I mean, I think we really are at this sort of, uh, this inflection point for data as we've, we've discussed already today. We've got consumers that are certainly much more connected. We have devices now that are much more connected. In fact, I was at CES and Naturally, there were a lot of um, new tablets and um, TV panels on, on display, but what seemed to really uh, grab hold of CES this year was the number of devices, for example, medical devices, such you know, extensions of uh, measuring data and um, helping to diagnose and track a lot of medical conditions. There is now a, an FDA-approved pill which has a, a chip the size of a, uh, a, gra a grain of sand which you can digest and produce readings which can then be used to monitor your health care. So uh, the number of devices that are connected is amazing, as is the media world which is very connected. And so all that data is starting to create um, uh, a lot of informed insight into consumers. I read the other day that there are uh, the average person uh, uh, uploads 3,654 different pieces of personal information onto a database every week. So that information has been collected. It's scary, but it's also insightful and um, a pretty exciting opportunity for, for marketers. 
So kind of let me kind of kick off the kind of questions with, um, with, with one for the whole panel. So I kind of wanted to ask the panel as a way of kicking off to give one example of a brand or client where the use of data has really informed and changed an approach to marketing that just wouldn't have been possible three, four, five years ago. Let me start with Shana. All right. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm going to give an example where the consumer really drove a business change, um, and through analytics we discovered this need, um, and it was a legacy change, a legacy business change that um, had been from the beginning of the company. It was for our Moen, Moen client, uh, they make faucets. We had seen, uh, through looking at analytics in Canada, some different results than in our U.S. market. And uh, the key KPI for them, uh, which was sending people to a where to buy page, was performing better in one market than the other. And so we wanted to figure out why. So we ran some A-B testing and some consumer surveys and discovered that um, actually, while the results were better in Canada, they were misleading. And that people were going there because there was actually no price that they could find <laughs> on the product detail page. So we, uh, we then also found through the survey that people expected the price to be within uh, 30% of the MSRP, and it wasn't. Um, so through that uh, data, we were able to then take that to the business units and identify that um, the wholesaler maybe wasn't quite as important as they used to be in the business model, and that we needed to adjust the pricing on the site, as well as put the pricing up front. Um, ultimately, the consumer um, drove this change because they've been asking and demanding uh, to be able to understand what their price point was online. Um, so, in a nutshell, we, we, we listened to the consumer and then we actually changed the way they drove the business, um, as well as starting to sell on Amazon, and we never would have known that otherwise. Greg? Great, thanks. Uh, two quick examples. You just mentioned Amazon. I mean, I continue to see Amazon as a beacon of, of personalization, and I think the transparency at which the they execute it is really key to me. We heard a panel earlier talking about how important trust is, and I really appreciate how Amazon goes about saying, these are the recommendations for you based on what you've bought in the past, whereas these are the recommendations based upon what you've browsed in the past. And I think that transparency really goes a long way in engendering that trust. And then in terms of a client, um, you, know, you heard Julie Bernard from Macy speaking earlier um, about all of the, uh, the custom books and the 500,000 different versions of a direct mail catalog that they did. Um, I really like what they're doing around their customer strategy and trying to personalize the experience across all of the touch points. And we're working with them now to actually implement customer level data across all channels. So whether it's search, email, online advertising, direct mail, to really create that seamless customer experience. Hey, everybody. Uh, so I think one of the biggest changes over the last few years has been our ability to process a massive amount of data in much less time. So, you know, we can take all the cookie level data from the ads that we serve and, and from the site side behavior and understand what's happening uh, within hours as opposed to weeks as it used to take you know, a few years ago, just because of the, the available technology out there and the, the cloud services that are out there. And so, so for an example is for a big box retailer, we've built a platform for them that allows them to take that cookie level behavior, tie it quickly back to the, the customer's profile based on past behavior, if, if we know who they are, and then deliver relevant messages. Ultimately, you know, if we know that somebody's in the market for a printer, we're going to be able to deliver relevant messages that, that um, fit what we know about that consumer based on their past brand behavior, and also based on the context that they're in. So if they're on the website, on the, on the uh, retailer's website, we're going to give one message out. If we see them out on the greater internet, we may give them another. And then if we see them on their mobile device, it's going to be another. And so uh, over the past year, year over year, they saw about a 12% lift just for making this change. And that was uh, specifically related to the, the same marketing spend. Hi. Um, on this morning's panel, Steve talked about uh, Chase and the kind of investment that, that that organization makes in direct marketing. And I think he referenced that tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of technology. We've worked with a lot of the credit card issuers, and as you know, they've for years have um, had these large prospecting database solutions that combine tri-bureaus and, and model on hundreds of elements and create modeling solutions in order to target uh, for both 
um, targeting as well as for risk management. Uh, recently, we've worked with one of the top five issuers to, um, to stand up a big data Hadoop environment that allows them to take what they used to model on one to two percent of the population and then extrapolate on, on look-alike type models to be able to model not only a hundred percent of the population, but also to include DFA data and clickstream data and other internal sources of data and create much more robust modeling environment. A little early to tell exactly what those results are going to be, but you can begin to see what the difference is in terms of not only how you target, but how you manage risk and how you uh, can treat through uh, creative and so forth through that much more robust modeling environment. Good morning. Caesars Entertainment is probably one of my favorite examples of how data really transformed marketing. So they track about 80% of how customers spend in the casino environment. And from that data, they discovered something they didn't previously know, which was that 0.15% of their customers were actually driving 12% of their revenue. As a marketer, that's pretty important to know. But what they did with it was pretty creative. For their higher value customers, they also know what their preferences are for shows, for dining experiences, et cetera. So they put in place something called a good luck ambassador. So if someone is having a less than positive gambling experience on the casino floor, they will deploy a luck, good luck ambassador to intervene and offer them tickets to the show or to a dinner so that when that customer leaves their property, they leave with an extremely positive customer experience regardless of how much money they may have won at the gambling table. So that's one of my faves. So those are all great examples. And, um and they're all coming from slightly different angles about, you know, segmenting customers, giving them better different advertising or pricing and mechanisms there. So what are the, sub for anyone, I mean, they all sound good and they all seem to be working, but I know behind all those successful case studies, there's always some challenges behind those. So would anyone want to comment on any of those specific examples, you know? reality of how to how to implement them and how to get a client on board and how to sell that in. Does anyone want to take that? I guess I'll go. <laughs> so I think that the real issue is getting results in terms of revenue or return on investment. And the biggest obstacle to me is getting started. We are data rich and insight poor. So I believe the best way to get started is to pick one campaign, use the data you have in house and generate a result in a side by side test versus control. And so the first time that I was involved doing this, we worked with Best Western. The dirty little secret is we used a a spreadsheet that had 30 days worth of transactional data. That was it applied sixth grade analytics, and at the end of the campaign, we almost doubled ROI. We were at 278% ROI, and on three revenue metrics, we were above 30%, looking again at test versus control. By doing that, it gave us the ammunition that we needed and the ammunition they needed to really step forward, because probably true in most of the examples we mentioned. This is a journey, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. So taking that first step, prove, and then going forward to me is really the key. Right. Greg, it, we talk, there's a lot of discussion about big data. So what, what, do you, what do you see as the things that's driving this with uh, a lot of clients at the moment? Well, I think two obvious drivers of big data are advances in mobile and social technology and usage. Um, social because it delivers unstructured data, um, which doesn't fit into fixed width binary fields. You know, data like tweets and comments and ratings and reviews and all of that. And then mobile because consumers are now interacting with brands at an unprecedented rate. And so the velocity and the volume of data that comes in is, is, is incredible. Um, but Really, I think big data or data means nothing without, if you don't have the wherewithal to organize it, bring it in, organize it, and analyze it. And as we heard, if, if these insights aren't really worth anything unless you can act upon them. Um, 
I went to school for statistics, and you know, when you're in school and you don't have work experience, you don't quite know what you're, how you're going to use things in, in the real world. And I remember seeing uh, the movie Traffic, and the most compelling use of statistics I ever saw was when a Mexican drug cartel member talked about using regression models to plan border crossing. And I was like, you know, that's a whole, you know, brought a whole new meaning to right person, right time, right place to me, right? Um, but then, you know, I learned a, of a more legitimate field, direct marketing and, and CRM. And I think, um, yes. a little, barely. Um, and so, you know, as a CRM guy, uh, what I'm really passionate about and excited about is not just big data, but the convergence of big data and addressable media channels. And I think with, with the fact with all these new opportunities to deliver one-to-one -one messages and offers and content to consumers means we have that much more data to be much more relevant to them. So it's kind of that virtuous cycle. Yeah, I think that whole conversion and address, explosion of addressability is really interesting. You know, I, I come from this kind of purely from the data side and the direct marketing side. And so this explosion you see between or this convergence between these traditional uh, tried and true direct marketing approaches and techniques and, and all of these new addressable medias that have historically been more brand and advertising oriented is, is fascinating to me because it's like everything old is, is new again. So um, we, we came up with this, um, this approach where we basically took what we thought were the tried and true direct marketing techniques across you know, five core capabilities and 20 dimensions and 73 attributes and tried to score what had made clients successful in that traditional direct marketing space and then how would you apply those going forward kind of in the new media world. It's really interesting what the gaps are between where clients are and where clients want to be are are exactly where you would expect them to be. You know, it's in the integration of online and offline data. It's in the uh, bringing all that together through the lifecycle management approach and driving experiences. It's in the managing, um, recognizing consumers across not just uh, channels, but across time and across um, anonymous to known and, and everything else. So it's, uh, it's a little deja vu. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to pick up on that point, Randy, because you talk about offline and online, and we have digital agencies, we have ad agencies, we have CRM agencies. So in, in the agency, this is a kind of question for anyone in the panel, but given that we've got an agency world full of a lot of vertical specialists, and you know, it seems to me there's a lot of this data is providing the opportunity to cut across those specialists, how can the agencies kind of react to that? Does, it, does anyone want to take that? Uh, sure. Pete? I mean, just one, one thing I think is that it, it forces clients to create a more collaborative environment. And I think the agencies that are going to thrive are going to be the ones that are, are kind of T-shaped. They have their area of expertise, but also have an appreciation for all of the other agencies at the table and are willing to, um, you know, not, not just be collaborative, but actually reach out and try, try to partner together. Yeah, okay, that sounds good in theory, but, you know, anyone here who's worked with agencies or in the agency world, in truth, that's quite difficult to do. So, you know, how, has anyone seen any models that sort of enable that? Yeah, um, it's a little easier when it's uh, one holding company. That does help. So in one example, you know, uh, we're doing this now within Omnicom. We work with TVWA, OMD, and Analect. Analect is our data warehouse BI uh, servicing agency. And we still, each of us with our channel expertise, will still do the strategy and data collection in those channels. And then we feed it all into the big uh, data warehouse system. They visualize it, aggregate it, bring it all together, and then we do the analysis together, and then we co-present together. So in that case, it's easy because we're all in the same holding company, um, but we can, we can all access the same data all in one place and, and then report on it together. Can Greg? I and, you know, from an agency perspective, I also think prioritizing the customer over the channel that you're talking in is, is kind of priority number one. Um, a lot of people are still very channel oriented and talking about channel planning, but I think a move towards customer models and customer planning um, will really allow people you know, to kind of get away from that and adopt more of a spirit of accountability and talk about what is the, what is the impact we're having on customers over time. Uh, it seems like every year we talk about, will this be the year of mobile? Um, I would suggest that it should be the year of the, the customer. 
and maybe every year should be the year of the customer, and we just have kind of stepwise changes each year and improvements. And so what's, you know, talk about, let's spend a bit of time on the agency side, because, you know, how are our agencies evolving? Because everyone, you know, including Mindshare, started from a, you know, a base of a very traditional world, uh, and those traditional roles and traditional scopes still stay in place, but obviously everyone's having to evolve. So you know, how are agencies evolving um, to, to really capture the data opportunity? So, uh, I, I mean, I think one of the ways that we're evolving is, or evolving is we're seeing our team um, along a spectrum of the, you know, the people who are quant-oriented, who want to be there pulling the levers, um, you know, kind of managing what, what's happening on the exchange, kind of trying to, trying to manage as much of the, um, the quantitative aspects of media planning and buying as possible. And then there's another, and they're, they're obviously partnered with our kind of consumer insights folks. And then there's another group that is much more um, brand oriented and wants to be partnering with the creative teams and thinking about the more up funnel activities. And, and obviously they, they need to partner closely, but that's one of the evolutions I think of the media planning specifically within our agency at least, is that there is that, um, there is that spectrum and we're acknowledging it and trying to support those uh, people and those uh, capabilities in the right way. Anyone else on the? Yeah, add. Um, I would say also the mindset is shifting depending on the client um, organization and, and appetite and uh, sophistication of their analytics that we're going in saying we're data driven or data led creative and strategy um, less so than creative led creative. Um, so it's kind of more of a collaboration and the whole mentality of the whole agency is shifting to feed the data in up front. Um, you know, if I have to limit scope, I don't do performance reporting, I do feeding the strategy instead. So historical analysis that will help inform creative and strategy. And, and where are the agencies getting these skills from? I mean, are they, you know, because it seems to me there's a lot of new skills that, um, haven't traditionally been in the agency. Where are you finding the talent to, to manage that? Yep. Um, I, I would say a lot of it were training. Um, some of the, the more quant-oriented folks are coming from the search world or from you know, people with backgrounds in statistics or, or math. Um, and then on the, the more up funnel st stuff, it tends to be people who are you know, may come from the, the more offline media world, right, who are just thinking about video and don't care if video is online, offline. They just want to be able to think about video agnostically and how consumers are engaging with it. Okay. Um, Shano, you, we talked a bit about um, creating this kind of 360 degree view, you know, moving out to a much more broader view and do you want to kind of comment a bit about, you talked a little bit about company culture and what's sort of needed there, and I'd be interested to hear from that. Sure. Um, so to get to analytics maturity really requires a, a culture uh, of that, that facilitates it. And uh, in the last, you know, six years working across 20 clients and pitching lots of clients, you become pretty quick at assessing how likely it is uh, analytics is going to be successful. Um, and so I kind of start on the, on the, the, on, a, on a spectrum. So there's the culture of advertising, which to your point earlier, um, has often lacked accountability. Um, and you'll see this more on the big beverage uh, brand side, more frequently than not, a lot of uh, you know, mass advertising. And then maybe a culture of research, more on the research side, where you see planners and strategy really driving a lot, but not quite as much on the quant side. And even internally, they find it's very hard to get budget to hire analytics people over uh, researchers. And then on the extreme side, uh, it'd be the culture of, anal or culture of accountability, which we see with our automotive clients. Um, and in this case, you know, everything revolves around the data. Uh, people, uh, salaries are based on the numbers. They have scorecards on the walls, not art. Um, everything really dry is driven around the data. So in those cases, those are the clients I think that are most likely to get to that 360 customer view. Um, but the next layer on top of that is that 
you need to have cross-channel accountability. And so even in, in cultures that are very sophisticated, if it's a single channel silo, you know, the website guy isn't accountable to the media guy. Um, so you're never gonna get to the 360 customer view if you don't care about the customer in their whole journey. Um, and if you're not incented to do it. So I think you really have to have cross-channel accountability and incentivize from the top down if you wanna get to that next level. It, the incentive piece is really key. I think accountability is such a scary word to, to a lot of people. And you know, I certainly don't want to sign up to be accountable for something if my boss doesn't tell me I have to be. But I think the, the flip side or the, the contrapositive of, of um, accountability is that I can be more effective if I, if I learn, if I, if I look at the data that's driving the, these results and understand how I can optimize it and tweak whether it's the targeting or the creative or the messaging, what have you, it's only going to drive results further. So there's, there's kind of the, the numerator side of accountability too, which I think uh, could be a more compelling incentive for some. All right, let's talk a little bit about the marketers and the clients. And, you know, I always find that folks in the agency and the sort of specialist capabilities that support the marketing services companies that support clients and the CMOs, generally they get a pretty good view of the marketing organisations themselves. So, Sandra, I wanted to ask you just where, where do you think the CMOs, um, how effective are they in using data? And kind of what are the kind of hurdles that they're, that they're coming across that you're seeing? Sure. The latest statistics that I looked at will give an idea of the magnitude of what I think the gap is. And two studies showed that 91% of CMOs absolutely recognize, like I think all of us do, that data can drive better business decisions. But only about 11% said they were actually using the data to drive business decisions. Even if that's not precise, I think it shows that we get it. We just don't know as CMOs what to do to actually drive results. And I believe the obstacles are really that data is daunting. And we all have some pretty ugly data in all of our organizations. I come from very data-rich organizations where we still have the issues of data is siloed. We can't access it real time. There are duplicate records for S. Zarati and Sandra Zarati, and I can't figure out how to resolve that. So that's why in my earlier example, I really recommend that you start with the data you have, a small subset, don't try to boil the ocean, do something with that, measure the impact, and then go forward. And I believe that that as a starting point will help more CMOs sort of lose the uh, fear or paralysis that some of us feel around using the data to actually drive better mar marketing outcomes. Does, any, does anyone else want to add to their perspective of marketers and what... Uh, yeah, I mean, just an example, I guess, that I'd give. So at, at Citibank, they have a, a CMO and a head of North American marketing who are very digitally oriented. Um, one came from Travelocity and one came from uh, Yahoo. So, so they were, they're wired that way and they've really pushed the organization that way over the last three years. But the challenge is that a lot of the systems and platforms weren't in place. So one thing that they did immediately was reach out to IT, build relationships there, start to collaborate with them, build a, a, a roadmap for where they wanted to take the organization. And you know, three years later, we're in a very different place. But it's a journey. I, like, like Sandra said, it's a journey and it, and it takes time, especially when you're in a, a giant corporation uh, like they are. Go ahead. I'll add one other company example, and that is, as a marketer, I feel so much pressure to produce better results with less spending. I don't know if anyone else feels that pressure. But um, one thing that data did provide for a company in the UK, it's called Rapid Racking. It's not really that glamorous, but they needed to reduce their cost of customer acquisition. They took the bold move of creating um, algorithms that help them predict what type of content certain targets would want. They reduced their direct marketing costs by 25% and they grew revenue overall by 8%, which is a pretty bold move. So when you feel that pressure and you don't really know what else to do, you're in pain and then you take action. And so I think that's a great impetus to move forward. Certainly one of the kind of high profile uh, marketers, if you can call them that, um, that recently really drove, used data to drive results was the Obama presidential campaign. And that, that was quite well documented 
Uh, yeah, the, what they did was, you know, I think he hired a huge data team um, and they were able to take voter files and cross-tabulate that against a lot of information that drove a lot of them, a lot of their efforts in terms of door-to-door -door canvassing, their email marketing programs, their social media programs. They even used that data to sort of select, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker as the ideal woman that people would want to have dinner with as a fundraiser, as well as they were very clever in the way they used uh, television and online advertising to to, to micro-target different voters and different motivations. So, and that that I think really blew the socks off, you know, everyone in terms of uh, how data really took centre stage in their marketing operations. Now, you know, they had a lot of money and they had a very clear focus of what they needed to do to, to win. But, you know, how can marketers, can marketers really follow that example? Randy, do you want to take this? Because I know there's something you... I think the answer is absolutely, of, of course, if they end up letting us. Um, because, you know, if you read that article, I think it was in time, the... Um, the number of times that, that there were actually practices referenced in that article that are, are practices that are frowned upon actually by agencies like the CFPB or the FTC was kind of amazing. I, I think it said that 75% um, of, their, of their models that they used to drive a, a lot of the targeting and uh, recruiting efforts and, and um, uh, solicit volunteers and everything else were based on uh, elements and I think four of the six that were referenced in the actual article are Reg B violations for the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. The other thing that I thought was interesting was they talked about uh, one of the areas that they really uh, focused on targeting were uh, consumers who had opted out of email between the 208 campaign and the, and the 2012 campaign. Um, and, you know, the idea that you would go to an opted out list for targeting, uh, although not necessarily targeting for what people specifically had opted out of, is both very, very creative and, and probably marginally frowned upon um, by, uh, by actually the agencies that are, that are now overseeing these kinds of things. So I, I think there were a number of things that jumped out just in terms of the value of kind of multidimensional insight. Uh, versus insight that can be gleaned from a single channel or a single point in time. The number of references through the article that talked about bringing together data um, that was either manually collected through canvassing efforts or collected online or collected through email responses or um, the times that they leveraged information that they had back in the 2008 campaign versus information that they had in the 2012. So really pretty much the whole gamut of multidimensional insight and analysis was one thing. The other thing that I thought was a great best practice that we should leverage is this whole idea of the bi-directional applications of insight. In other words, um, taking insight that you learn in maybe a traditionally offline type channel or interaction and really using that in your online interactions as well as taking uh, the insight that you learn in, interaction, in uh, interactive online channels and pushing that back into the other channels. I thought that those were a couple of areas where uh, you see a lot of marketers now trying to do those same sorts of things, and it'll be really interesting to see um, how that whole regulatory world evolves. Uh, you know, just to add to that, I think it's also a great example of to use Randy's term from earlier, deja vu, and, and just how the channel arsenal is expanding for, for direct marketers and database marketers. I mean, the, the tactics that the Obama administration or campaign employed are nothing different than what Karl Rove and the Re Republicans have been doing for years, but it's just that now Twitter is, Twitter is popular and you know, email, is, email is more popular and there's higher penetration across all these channels. And so it's really just the utilization of all these hardcore direct marketing techniques across a broader spectrum. And I think that's why it was so powerful. I mean, they took it to another level. I mean, if you, if you had, if you'd clicked at the Obama button and you had one of your friends was based in Ohio. I mean, you were getting sent messages saying, "Please contact so and so and ask them to register and get out to vote early." I mean, it was, it was taking it. The execution of it, I think, was was well, was really impressive. So we're going to ask some questions from the the audience. I'm going to just, just uh, I'm going to ask one more question. And if you if you have any questions for this panel, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but I wanted to perhaps just 
throw to the panel, maybe Shana, you might help. Uh, if we could discuss the P word, the old privacy thing, and how, you know, what, what should we be worried about in terms of the, cons one, consumer's reactions, and then two, the regulators? Yeah, um, I think uh, we all have to just suck it up and stop ignoring it. <laughs> uh, it it's really not going away, and it's not going to get better. For us, I, I really studied it heavily um, in the last year. Um, the EU cookie law is pretty serious stuff. Uh, while they didn't uh, choose to end up enforcing it quite as much as they had been saying they were going to, because really they didn't have the money <laughs> to enforce it, um, it's still been going on. And there's been even more legislation in the Netherlands and Australia and some of these other countries. And the U.S. is really following what Europe is doing. Um, and if you talk to people like uh, Mimi Rasmussen, the chief privacy officer at Adobe, she'll say the guys on the Hill don't know they don't understand the ramifications of these lo laws they're putting into place. And the consumer doesn't understand the ramifications. So I think education is a huge component of uh, the privacy spectrum where, you know, if someone found out, well, if I don't give my browsing history on Netflix, I'm actually not going to get personalized recommendations anymore. Um, if I just want to give them my name and my demographics, maybe I get some, something that's sort of okay. but. I don't think they understand that turning, turning off the data is going to really impact their experience. And I think we as marketers need to help get PR and media a little bit on our side to help tell the story that uh, without robust data collection, you're not going to have all the features and functionality that we just spent the last 15 years giving you what you wanted. Um, so, but at the same time, we can't ignore it. And the best thing you can do right now is to be transparent. Um, Get uh, your lawyers up to speed, change your privacy policies, put the ad choices on your banner ads. Um, just And then in, in the future, you have the ability to change functionality based on different levels of what data you collect on people. Um, we may have to do that. So getting your tech team up to speed, um, as well as your legal team, I think is the first thing you can do right now, as well as auditing your, your websites uh, for third-party cookies and rogue stuff. Um, would be the urgent urgent matters. Randy, did you want? To yeah, add I to would. Um, I love the way Julie talked about it earlier today when she really eff emphasized the value exchange that um, that consumers are getting as a benefit as a result of the information that's shared and the encouragement that she gave to everyone in the audience to, you know, to really proactively um, promote you know that value exchange both with your consumers and with regulatory agencies. Um, if you look at what's going on today in financial services with the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Board, uh, I think it's a good preview into maybe some of the directions that, that the FTC and, and others may be going. And so I would encourage you, I would encourage you to do that. There's some really uh, interesting and in some ways frightening things, you know, going on. I think uh, that to Shana's point, you know, the transparency and the disclosure and being clear uh, about what you intend to do with the data is really important. One, one caution that I would, I would just share is especially as these big data analytic environments expand, it's so easy to put data into those environments and use it to, uh, you know, to glean insights and, and create new analytic models. And um, on that maturity model that I talked about earlier, interesting enough, privacy and compliance and uh, information governments were the two lowest scoring dimensions of the 20 uh, dimensions and best practices that I, that I talked about. And yet, there are so many things now that could be done that probably shouldn't be done. And, uh, and if you do something today, um, realizing that the rules might change tomorrow, you really, have to, you really have to think about information governance and privacy compliance in a different way as we kind of embark on this explosion of the use of data. Just one last thing to add to that. There's, a, I think we, we may see a surgence of something called permission-based marketing. Um, and that's where, you know, you, you tell people, you're going to get X, Y, and Z if you give us this set of data. Um, and so I've, I already know there are some companies, startups happening uh, that are focusing their whole business model around it. Okay, do we have any questions from uh, the audience? Hi there, this is Matthew from Wasabi. So data-driven marketing, a lot of these initiatives are typically a lot more flexible online than offline. 
In the drive for accountability, what kind of challenges and how do we overcome the need to demonstrate incremental ROI, especially in the face of um, a world where a lot of customer reach points are online, but a customer ultimately may transaction both online and offline? Does anyone, does anyone want to take that? Well, I mean, I, I think that, um, I think multi-channel attribution is is paramount these days, and a lot of people are, are, are trying to figure it out, especially in, in the, the omni-channel world where people are buying both on, online and offline. We, we work with a lot of our clients to try to understand what is that in-store influence factor of, of online engagement. And I think, you know, regardless of the model that you choose, whether it's last click or straight line amortization or what have you, I think trying to do something is, is, is better than nothing and um, just optimizing it over time as, at as granular a level as you can get. I mean, I think it's, people said earlier, it's, it's a journey and it's not something you're just gonna flip the switch on. And, and uh, I totally agree with that. And I, I saw an interesting Forrester study that said, I think 46% uh, of marketers were not doing any kind of attribution, even last click attribution, which is amazing to me. But, um, you know, I, th I think the other thing, just at a basic level, along with attribution, is just the, the metrics for offline marketers versus online marketers tend to be very different, and, so I th and, and by channel as well. So I think just getting alignment on metrics, uh, marketing metrics, and then trying a as hard as you can to tie those back to the business objectives, I think that's a great place to start. Are any of you, are any of you, to reiterate something that Julie asked earlier, are any of you seeing signs of being too relevant uh, with consumers, of getting tedious by being too, too highly targeted? Are we at, are any of you at that or see any signs of that yet or, or we know what that looks like? I, I mean, I don't think I've seen it. There was the example in that, I think it was a Times article about the, the dad who received uh, some, uh, that from Target, he received the direct mail that, you know, indicated that his daughter was pregnant before he knew she was pregnant. I don't think she even knew at that time. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think there are places where that line is being crossed. Um, and I think as marketers, we need to be aware of it. And I guess the, the way I lean generally is as much as possible towards transparency and, and making sure the value exchange is there. What, and what those, uh, that BI team did after that example, they started adding irrelevant uh, images into the ad so it wasn't quite as obvious. So they throw in a tractor or like, you know, like Tar targeted <laughs> irrelevance is the, next, is the yeah. next big thing. <laughs> We're gonna have, we'll, we'll have a panel on that next year, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Panel, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask, uh,